today and uh, participate in this uh, important conference. So maybe if I have the, the instrument, that would be better. Thank you. It was not a desire for vengeance, but a desire for justice, the lawyer told the court at the trial I attended a few months before I started my ethnographic research on urban policing in the banlieue of Paris. The defendants were seven police officers who were indicted for acts of violence. The photographs of the plaintiff, a man from Turkey, whose swollen and bruised face appeared on the front page of a Turkish monthly little after the incident, left little doubt about the actual brutality he had endured at the hands of the law enforcement agents. Based on the complete case file that the public prosecutor gave me after a conversation I had later on, I could piece together the story of the unfortunate man. On New Year's Eve, the local police station had received a phone call from the resident of a housing project who reported a scuffle which started at a family party after intruders tried to get into the community hall where it was held. It was late in the night. The officers on duty who had been celebrating the holiday and were by then fairly intoxicated rushed to the scene, sirens wailing. More than two dozen dozens agents from neighboring precincts hurriedly joined them. All were heavily equipped with riot gear helmets, and batons. When they arrived on the premises, the project was calm, with only the voices of a group of people conversing near the place where the party had taken place. At the sight of the sudden and impressive deployment of police force, these late bystanders started to run away, immediately chased by the agents. After a few minutes of stampeding and shouting, which awakened the inhabitants who angrily protested, from the windows of their apartments, the meager prey was brought back to the cars and taken into custody. Two men, one from Caribbean origin, who had just left the community hall, the other from Turkey, who was also returning home after another family gathering. Both were badly hurt, the latter being later diagnosed with a perforation of the eardrum, periorbital hematomas, and acromioclavicular strain. It appeared during the investigation that the two men had experienced similar physical assault. As they were fleeing, they were stopped, pinned to the ground, beaten, uh, <coughs> uh, beaten with nightsticks, and sprayed with tear gas. Even after they had been handcuffed, they continued to be roughed up, punched, and kicked in the car and subsequently at the station. Rather than being taken to the hospital to have a medical examination, they were held into custody under the accusation of insulting the police and resisting arrest. This could have led to an immediate appearance trial and a prison sentence, but as the pros public prosecutor told me, because of the international resonance of the incident, the Ministry of Justice requested that in contrast with what would usually happen in similar situations, this case of police violence be treated in an exemplary manner by the judicial system. In fact, only the Turkish victim lodged a complaint. The Caribbean man decided to avoid the expenses and the trouble of a trial. To affirm that the investigation was a model of fairness would be, however, an overstatement as all 79 witnesses interviewed by police officers with the exception of a few were, were police officers with the exception of few fi firefighters. No one from the project was heard by the judge. During the trial, one learned that at the beginning of the intervention, the sergeant major had galvanized his troops with these words. We lost the Algerian war 40 years ago. We chickened out. We're not going to do it again today. Take no prisoners. It's no hold, bar no hold barred. Remarkably, 
the public prosecutor did not choose to consider this cry to be an aggravating circumstance, which should have been uh, in, invoked uh, if it had been deemed racist or discriminatory, which was not the case for him. Such characterization of the fact might not have been irrelevant since the aggressive call of the officer in charge of the squad had been uttered, uttered as his men were bursting into a neighborhood whose residents were, for the most part, North and Sub-Saharan Africans from former French colonies. The verdict was lenient. One officer was acquitted. Six who had admitted their involvement in the assaults received four months suspended prison sentences with no mention in their criminal record, which allowed them to continue their professional activity. They were also required to pay collectively 12,000 euros, about $15,000, to the victim for bodily injury and moral wrong. Yet, three years later, the Turkish man had still not received one cent from his persecutors. And when his lawyer inquired of the Ministry of the Interior where the officers had been posted after they had left the precinct so as to be able to claim the payment for, of the damages, the answer was that no one knew where they were. The statement by the lawyer that the use of force by the officers expressed their desire for justice may sound surrealistic when one tries to imagine the two men being beat, beaten up during the arrest, even after having been handcuffed and again roughed up while kept in custody especially if one realizes that there was absolutely no evidence of their involvement in any wrongdoing, and that it was not even clear from the testimonies collected on the spot that there had ever been more than a verbal altercation at the party. However, I want to take seriously this claim and rather, or rather explore the possibility that such violence be thought of as ordinary punishment and therefore as a form of retributive justice. <clears throat> and this is, uh, this is what, uh, ironically, this badge of an anti-crime uh, squad expresses by its appropriation and diversion of the title of Michel Foucault's famous Surveiller et Punir, Discipline and Punish. That's what they wear on their shoulder. In the present case, <clears throat> as in many others I have witnessed or been, been told, the punishment takes two forms. Physical, with a thrashing in the street or at the station. Legal, with the accusation of insulting the police and resisting arrest. My assertion undoubtedly goes against common sense which would interpret these events as pure brutalization against the ethos of law enforcement, which barely acknowledges an excessive use of force that can be excused by the warlike context of public housing, and against both legal theory and moral uh, philosophy, whose definition of punishment precisely excludes such acts uh, for being outside the judicial realm. Against these various normative stances, I want to examine the retributive dimension of the exertion of violence in policy. Because it is a justified or justifiable practice in the eyes of many officers. Because it is effectively protected by the institution. Because it is treated with clemency by the judges. Because it may even be encouraged by the state. And perhaps above all, because it targets certain populations, namely low-income categories belonging to ethno-racial minorities, all affirmation that I will uh, later develop, I argue that it should be regarded as an extrajudicial punishment. Far from being a deviant practice, it reveals that for, that for what concerns its lower segments, society delegates a significant part of the retributive justice process to the police. This shift of perspective on punishment has important theoretical as well as political implications. 
Such argument is nevertheless not entirely new. If the word punishment does not appear as an entry in the indexes of most classics on the police written by criminologists from William Wesley, Jerome Skolnick, and James Q. Wilson to Peter Manning, Albert Rice, and Jean-Paul Brodeur, the idea of punishment is sometimes present between the lines as a potential manifestation of the discretionary power of law enforcement agents, although it is generally presented as a moral justification of their seemingly deviant practices. The best illustration of this complacent interpretation is Karl Klokar's famous uh, 1980 paper, The Dirty Harry Problem. It is inspired by Inspector Callahan, alias Dirty Harry, the hero played by Clint Eastwood in the eponymous 1971 film directed by Don Siegel. A man of few words and bad temper, who has the reputation of dealing with difficult cases in his own way, Callahan ends up substituting himself for the ineffective justice system that is incapable of stopping a serial killer from committing murders and even releases him after he has been arrested by the officer due to procedural issues. Against his superior's orders, Callahan tells the criminal, uses torture to have him confess where he keeps one of his victims, and finally shoots him, shoots him dead after an epic chase as the man has taken hostage a dozen children in a school bus. By executing the criminal in cold blood, he administers, he administers justice. He punishes the culprit. For Clockers, the story illustrates a fundamental dilemma. Quote, policing constantly places its practitioners in situations in which good ends can be achieved by dirty means. End quote. In the film, this dilemma, the unsolvability of which is epitomized in the last scene by Callahan throwing his badge into the water of the pond, uh, where the serial killer's dead body is sinking, takes an extreme and almost caricatured form as on the one hand, the criminal is a dangerous and sadistic psychopath, and on the other hand, both law enforcement and judicial institutions prove to be impotent. Under these circumstances, the viewer is expected not only to feel sympathy for the solitary writer of wrongs, but also to understand that the police need to use dirty means for good ends if they want to protect society from crime. The, qu the question raised by clockers only concerns the dirty means. Can they be justified as punishment? Should they in turn be punished? But it does not challenge the good ends. Even in the case of stop and searches, for which racial profiling has long been documented, he finds argument to exonerate the officers from their discriminatory practices. Quote, Although the probability of coming up upon a dangerous felon is extremely low, policemen quite reasonably take the possibility of doing so as a working assumption on the understandable premise that once is enough." Unquote. This understanding of policing, based on the reproduction of the agent's justification, is frequent in criminology. Yet, during the 15 months of my ethnographic research in the largest French police district, where crime rates were uh, significantly higher than the national average, I have much more often observed dirty means for dirty ends, as in the assaults against uh, the Caribbean and Turkish men, than dirty means for good ends, as in Dirty Harry's scenario. But I contend that in both cases, one should consider that from a sociological perspective, the police were the punishment. Of course, I do not discard the existence of good means for good ends, which I have also witnessed, although quite rarely in disadvantaged neighborhoods and with black or Arab men. <clears throat> in 1979, Malcolm Filet published a book which had a profound influence on court studies and soon became a classic in the social legal field, The Process is the Punishment subtitled Handling Cases in a Lower Criminal Court. It shows that, contrary to common representation of the administration of justice, in the great majority of cases, especially those regarding minor offenses, decisions are made and sentences imposed 
outside procedural justice. Only one third of the defendants facing jail time have a counsel. Bails imposed on arbitrary criteria lead to defendants being detained before adjudication twice more often than as the consequence of jail sentences. Plea bargaining rather than adversarial confrontation with prosecutors result in the fact that only a minority of defendants have a fair trial. Costs, both direct, related to the bail, the lawyer's fees, and the court's procedures, and indirect, in terms of time spent within the judicial bureaucracy and risk of losing one's job, imply a profound inequality before the justice system. It should be noted that the study having been conducted four decades ago, most of its finding would look much more dramatic in the present judicial system in the United States. At that time, there was approximately seven times less people in prison. The crucial conclusion drawn by Philae is that the pretrial phase, which most of the time is not even followed by a trial, is when justice is commonly administered that multiple social factors unrelated to the case appear more determining than the alleged offense itself, and that the combination of these elements produces profound disparities. I want to extend these conclusions by showing that even before what Philae calls the process, with its attorneys and judges, bailiffs and sheriffs, bail bondsmen and bail commissioners, representatives of family relation and drug treatment program, or the equivalent major players and supporting actors in other parts of the world. They are the police which play a crucial role in the street and at the precinct as part of the punitive system. It is a sort of pre-trial which may or may not precede a trial or even a pre-trial and can be either a contributing factor to the judicial process, the framing of the person or of his indictment, or entirely self-contained, a, corp a corporeal or moral chastisement. So what is punishment? In order to affirm that it is part of police practices, one has to circumscribe what it is. Legal theorists and moral philosophers have long attempted to give an answer to this question. The most widely accepted definition is that, is that of H.L.A. Hart, half a century ago, and it provides five decisive criteria. The infliction of a pain or an unpleasant equivalent to an actual or supposed offender in response to an offense against legal rules, that is intentionally imposed by a legal authority and administered by human beings with appropriate roles. Although the definition is said to be independent from any justification, it assumes that punishment is both legitimate, since it sanctions an offender for the offense he has committed, and legal, since it is applied under the law for a violation of the law. Under this normative definition, which describes not what punishment is, but uh, what ought to be regarded as punishment, which is very different, law enforcement has no place, except as the lawful provider of cases for the judicial system. The police are not supposed to inflict pain on offenders, and their legal authority does not imply that such would be an appropriate role for them. But should we limit our inquiry to the verification of the matching of actual practices with the a priori definition? In fact, Hart himself insists that one should never use what he calls a definitional stop, allowing one to say whether an action, uh, a given action is or not a punishment, to elude a more radical and critical questioning about the nature and rationale of the, the act of punishing. To avoid this, piece, this pitfall, I will reverse the reasoning by approaching the, dimly, the delimitation of punishment a posteriori and not a priori. So consider the following scene. 
One late afternoon, the resident of a small newly uh, built housing project calls the police to inform them on the presence of a noisy quad bike in the park nearby. A crew is quickly dispatched to the site and on their arrival, the three officers attempt to intercept the vehicle. Trying to escape, the young driver falls off his vehicle without hurting himself and the officers rush to catch him. As they are bringing, uh, they are bringing him under control, Several youth come to the defense of their friend, surrounding the agents and protesting the arrest. Feeling threatened, the three men decide to retreat and call the precinct for reinforcements. A few minutes later, half a dozen police vehicles, including unmarked ones with anti-crime squads on board, arrive at the scene with lights flashing and sirens wailing. More than a dozen officers storm into the little park where families are still enjoying the long spring daylight with children playing near their parents. As they try to catch at random the youth hanging around, officers run into some of these peaceful bystanders, hurling racist insults at them and shoving them out of the way. A woman who loudly interposes herself to protect her son is forcibly apprehended. A nine-year-old boy who has talked back to an officer is menaced with a flashball next to his face. Convinced that they have identified the leader of the group of young men, the police hustle into the staircase of the three-story building and break the door of the apartment where his parents live. Aggressively searching for the young man, they knock over his sister as she comes out of her bedroom, having heard the turmoil. They finally find the suspect, pin him down, handcuff him, and take him in for questioning, only to discover that he is blind, which will make him, in court, the very unlikely perpetrator of an assault. They eventually release him. Of the dozen residents, mostly youth, who have been taken in for, for questioning, five are held in custody under the charge of insulting the police and resisting arrest, including the rebellious mother and four youth who suffer from various injuries, while the others are freed and left outside the precinct in the middle of the night with almost three miles to walk back home as no transportation is available at that time. Hospitalized, the blind, man, the blind man's sister is diagnosed with a broken arm and a neck lesion. The next day, the local branch of a police union publishes a communique denouncing, quote, groups of youth who assaulted and seriously injured several officers perpetrating acts of violence with unspeakable savagery, unquote. When I later inquire uh, about these injuries, I'm told by the officers that one of the, of the three uh, who were initially involved sprained his ankle while retreating to call for reinforcements. Such incidents were common during my research. When they go wrong, they can provoke the death of a resident and lead to urban disorders. This is how the 2005 riots started, a group of adolescents being chased by the police in a project for a theft they had not committed. Three of them finding refuge in an electric trans transformer where two died and the third one was severely burnt. The police, although aware of the danger, deciding not to intervene. The government, instead of expressing sympathy for the victims, defaming them as thugs they were not. Fortunately, the majority of these incidents has less tragic conclusions and even remain ignored by the public as the one I just uh, narrated. The present case <clears throat> is interesting on several counts. First, there is a quantitative disproportion between the initial nuisance of a noisy quad or even the adolescent's protest against the arrest of their friend and the massive aggressive and indiscriminate response of the police. Second, there is a qualitative disconnection between the alleged offenses and the alleged offenders, since instead of the driver of the vehicle and the rebellious youth, it is mere bystanders who end up being arrested and indicted. Against them, the retribution is of two, two sorts, collective and random. On the one hand, the whole group endures the excessive use of force, its members being scared, reviled, pushed, thumped, threatened with weapons. It is a punitive expedition. 
The deputy commissioner told me that she was aware of the deleterious effects of such actions and often tried to invade, in vain to avoid them. In fact, the intervention affected further the neighborhood. Indeed, the local association of tenants had engaged for several years various actions to make the project safer and nicer, developing sociability among families, organizing weekends at the sea for teenagers, and keeping their environment clean from litter and graffiti. Viewed as a result of a call to the police by one of the residents, the brutal operation jeopardized the trust that had been slowly built between adults and youth. On the other hand, anyone in the group, usually the slowest runner or the least lucky passerby, gets beaten up, arrested, and indicted in place of the supposed culprit. It is blind justice. In these cases, the retribution can be both immediate and deferred. On the spot, individuals are randomly roughed up as they try to run away or simply or even simply happen to be present at the scene, with in some cases severe injuries as a result. Then they can be taken, taken into the station and accused of an offense. In most cases, for lack of evidence of wrongdoing, they are released, but the officers know that their punishment will have consisted of their being handcuffed in front of friends, relatives, and neighbors, and during distressing questioning, dotted with menace at the precinct, and ending back in the street far from their home, a practice that has been denounced by a judge's uni union as a common form of iniquitous penalty. The mere fact of having been, uh, been arrested uh, al always presents some advantage in, in uh, excuse me, the, the mere fact of having arrested someone uh, always presents some advantage in the eyes of the police. In some cases, however, especially when the individuals have been injured and are suspected of being tempted to file a complaint for police violence, the officers indict them for insulting an officer and resisting arrest, an offense that can be sanctioned by two years in prison and 30,000 euros fine when occurring collectively. Such practice is doubly beneficial for the police since the alleged suspects are punished twice in the street where they have been thrashed and in court where their word is of little weight against the word of a sworn officer. Thus far, I have implied that what, I've, what I described corresponded to a form of punishment. But is it the case? Can the violence deployed by the police be assimilated to retribution? Is it not plain abuse of power, sheer domination, pure repression? And since it is in response to an alleged offense against the police, is it not simply a reprisal? Let us examine these two alternatives. According to the first option, the violence hypothesis, such set of actions would be mere excess in the use of force or illegal language, inappropriate and disproportionate use of coercion. That there is brutality cannot be doubted. To view it as punishment implies that there be a good reason to exert it. In other words, that a sort of justice is being administered for a wrong that has been committed. After the infamous brutalization of Rodney King, Jerome Skolnick and James Pfeiffer inscribed the episode in the long history of vigilante justice in the United States, including the lynching of blacks in the South. According to the second option, the vengeance hypothesis. The operation is a mere retaliation by the police against the youth who have threatened their colleagues. To view it as punishment, one would have to exclude the possibility that it simply serves to avenge the affront and teach a lesson. In an effort to differentiate retribution from revenge, Robert Nozick affirms that contrary to, uh, to the former, the latter, that is revenge, does not necessarily concern the wrong, has no limit, is personal, involves emotions, and provides no generality. It is, however, often difficult to, to establish such, such distinction in concrete situation, and it appears that such normative definitions have mostly for function to legitimize certain forms of violence, and uh, while delegitimizing de 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 others. 
against both objection that I just formulated, that in the scene I reported it is a matter of violence or reprisal, and not punishment, I argue that this is the wrong way to pose the problem. First, in accordance with Egon Bittner, we can affirm that the police authorization, his words, to use force is essentially unrestricted, rendering the talk about lawful use of force practically meaningless, his words. Second, in agreement with Emile Durkheim, we can admit that punishment has remained for us what it was for our predecessors, meaning that it is an act of vengeance, his words again. So the fact that in, an inc in the incident recounted, there are acts of violence and the sense of revenge does not exclude the possibility that it is also a form of punishment. How to decide then whether the intervention of law enforcement units in the housing project is a punishment or not? Two kinds of argument may be used. One subjective refers to the uh, meaning given by the agents to their action. The other objective concerns the interpretation the analyst, the observer, can make of the course of action. In the case of police uh, aggressive behavior toward given publics, both arguments strongly speak in favor of punishment. First, on the subjective side, the agents themselves consider it as such, that is, as punishment. It is not, not only that they would try, the police officers, that they would try to mask reprehensible practices of vengeance by fear of consequences from their hierarchy or the justice system, they do find moral justifications for their acts to themselves. These are of two kinds. On the one hand, officers view the lower classes as criminal, having little capacity of discernment when they deal with ethno-racial minorities, since they are not attuned to the signs of respectability among them, as Robert, Robert Rayner formulates. They know, of course, that not all the inhabitants of the project commit, commit crime, but they have a hard time differentiating among them those who should be deemed suspect, largely because of ethno-racial prejudices that are reinforced during their training in the academy and their socialization in their first posts. They are unable to recognize thugs from honest people, the commissioner admitted to me. They cannot imagine that a black guy with a hoodie can be a PhD student and not a hoodlum, the mayor observed in one of our conversations. Moreover, in their eyes, even when, <coughs> even when people from these neighborhoods have done nothing wrong, they are viewed as accomplices of those who have, since they do not denounce them. This belief does not seem to be affected by the evidence that they receive calls and sometimes information from residents about violence, thefts, or drug trafficking. But this confusion is effective in justifying that even if they do not arrest the right person, those who are caught either have committed at some point in their life an offense for which they may have not been punished, or have been aware of one without reporting it to the police. Like the wolf in La Fontaine's fable, replying to the lamb who protests his innocence, officers could retort, if not you, then your brother, all the worse, or someone else in your clan, for to me, you're all, you're all of you a curse. This negative generalization is in line with the officer's view that the population in general is hostile. This negative, the, the despite opinion polls that put them on top of the most appreciated civil servants, they are convinced that the public has no sympathy for them, or at least they pretend they do. But this misperception is definitely differentiated. It mostly concerns the youth of immigrant origins. They do not like us, the bastards, commented the chief of the anti-crime squad as we were slowly driving by a group of African and Arab youth who were watching us. The term bastards was a common way of designating young people belonging to ethno-racial minorities that they dealt with. After a pause, he added, but we don't like them either. This imagined or actual antagonism serves two functions. It reinforces group solidarity 
as the officers consider uh, they have to defend themselves against this, these potential enemies. And it makes reciprocity reasonable as their animosity seem to, to them a relevant response to the population's animosity. The badges that you can see here of the anti-crime squads attest to their worldview. One of them depicts, against the background of the French national flag, the tall blocks of a stylized representation of housing project seen through a gun sight. Another, a spider trapping a complex of high buildings in its web. And I let you discover the other ones. On the other hand, officers regard the justice system as too lenient toward the suspect whom they refer to the prosecutor, since in their eyes, uh, sorry, uh, since, quote, in their eyes, their decision to lay a charge deserves to be supported by judges, by, uh, by punishment, that it's amnesty is the authority of law, law enforcement machinery, as Richard Erickson explains. We arrest criminals, and the next day they're outside again. The judges have freed them. One wonders what we work for. Such was the lament often heard during our patrols during, uh, through the projects. Again, evidence contradicts this assertion. Surveys demonstrate that the justice system is particularly severe, that this severity regularly increases, and that it focuses on petty crime. Actually, the reason why the police believe that judges are sabotaging their work is that they often arrest suspects without minimal proofs. As a surgeon told his men one evening in the car, there have been too many police abuses. We have taken too many liberties. It's like us with the youngster, we don't trust them. Well, you know what? The judges feel the same about us. But his call for probity, and it was an exception in this matter, could not be heard because the police mis misrepresentation had a social function. Disqualifying the judges as merciful legitimized their own harshness. Consequently, as a result of their prejudices regarding both crimes, both crime in the lower class and clemency in the justice system, the two elements that I just gave you, officers find a moral justification to what they deem just punishment towards individuals who deserve it but might not be punished otherwise. So I've uh, mentioned this subjective dimension. Now second, the objective one. The institution, the state, and in the end, society as a whole, participate in this idea that the police are part of the punitive apparatus. Since the 1970s, the discourse of law and order has progressively swamped the public sphere and the political realm. The historic victory of the left in the general election of 1981, after 23 years of conservative domination in France, led to the restructuring of the French political landscape with the rapid rise of the far right and the weakening of the traditional right. The National Front, Front National, based its success principally on two issues, immigration and security, often, often mixing the two by presenting immigrants or their children as the major source of insecurity. The response of the conservative was to radicalize its discourse, adopting xenophobic themes and producing alarmist statements. In insight, this strategy paid off in terms of electoral successes during the following three decades. In this context, the police benefited from expanded human and technical resources, special units, the anti-crime squads in particular, were created. New prerogatives, notably in terms of stop and search, were added to the code of criminal procedure. These policies were not meant to be implemented everywhere toward everyone. The banlieue with, the, with their housing projects were their main focus. Their resident, especially the working class youth belonging to ethnic minorities, were their principal target. And this evolution that I describe has been even amplified in recent months uh, with the inclusion in the, uh, uh, the normal legal system of the main measure of the state of emergency. So there, we are uh, ending the state of emergency because the main measures of emergency have been included in normal law. The exception has become the norm. In this context, <clears throat> 
Uh, excuse me. The, the, um, one night, as we were cruising in the center, in the city center, the sergeant major recognized an Arab man in his 30s in the street. Since he had arrested him several weeks before, he manifested his surprise but was told by his colleagues that the man had received a suspended prison sentence. Don't worry, he'll get it. We'll have no problem finding something to make him break his suspension order. I tell you, he'll serve his time. Indeed, their interventions in these territories included various forms of provocation, either verbal via racist insults or physical via, <coughs> via harsh treatment <coughs> during stop and frisks. These provocations sometimes led to responses from the youth who either talked back or pushed them back, thus opening the way to the accusation of insulting an officer and resisting arrest. This offense, which as the agents themselves and their superiors admitted to me, corresponded to situation of police misconduct rather than youth misbehavior, has skyrocketed in the previous decade, two decades. The institution forcefully backed this practice as the Ministry of the Interior encouraged officers to file complaints and request financial compensation, paying their lawyers' fee, fees and asking for special severity from prosecutors. One evening in a conversation at the station, a young officer explained to his colleagues that he had found a decree dating back from the time when tuberculosis was endemic, uh, was in the 1940s that imposed a fine for spitting in a public space. In public place. Excited at the idea of reviving this offense, he joked, it's great, if I see anyone spitting, I slap a charge on him, and with a bit of luck, it, it'll end with resisting the police. The agents never ran out of imagination in that regard. They knew they would be supported by their institution. In light of the subjective and objective element that I gathered so far to interpret the intervention in the housing project, one can therefore reasonably argue that it is a punitive operation. This is how the police justify, justify it to themselves and their superiors, and this is the kind of practice on which the state, at best, turns a blind eye. This interpretation has two important theoretical implications. First, Rather than attempting to verify that facts match, match the definition, one should strive to adapt the latter to the former, the, fact, the definition to the facts. Here, the meaning that the agents give to their acts and the analysis one can make of what underlies them lead to contest the criteria proposed by normative theorists. When a reality does not fit its definition, it is the definition that should be revised. Second, while it is conceptually relevant to try to separate definition from justification as these scholars do, it is empirically difficult to do so as well as politically problematic. Officers and their institution do need arguments, albeit fallacious, to legitimize what would otherwise appear as deviance. It is not the task of the researcher to help them doing it. Putting together the various pieces of the jigsaw puzzle in light of the classical definition of punishment, we can see that the police operation is conducted by a legal institution that is not designed to punish, but considers itself entitled as it is incited by public authorities to do so. That the offenses sanctioned do not match the initial motive of the intervention and can even be fabricated so as to neutralize potential complaints, and that in the absence of an identifi identifiable offender, the sanction can translate into punitive expedition and random or random punishment. Finally, that it adopts extra-legal forms such as physical and moral abuse. What I have analyzed about France is in no way specific. In recent years, law enforcement agencies have increasingly appeared in various parts of, parts of the globe, globe as suppliers of extrajudicial punishment. In Brazil, human rights organization calculated that more than 5,000 people were killed by the police um, between 2005 and 2014 uh, in Rio de Janeiro as part of the so-called pacification of the favelas. In the Philippines, official statistics revealed that during the sole month of July and August 2016, more than 1,800 suspects were shot dead, including 700 by the police. 
as a result of the war on drugs declared by the newly elected president. In the United States, as you know, uh, more than 1,100 deaths caused by the police were registered in 2015. That is 40 times more than those by capital punishment during the same period. And remarkably, the social racial profile of victims is similar. And I just show you something you may have seen, which shows that in uh, the first 24 days of 2015, there were more people being killed by the police in the United States than in the last 24 years in England and Wales. The interpretation of these homicides as extrajudiciary punishments varies according to the context. In some cases, the statements made by politicians and the positive reaction from the part of the population leave no doubt about the well-assumed penal populism. In others, the support of these practices by the authorities their facilitation by the institution, the impunity they benefit from, and the complacent silence that accompanies them reveal latent or veiled expression of this populism. But the punitive function of law enforcement should not be reduced to these extreme manifestations. On a daily basis, for many belonging to the most vulnerable groups, it translates into harassment, provocations, humiliations, racist insults, undue stops, unjustified searches, abuse, abusive fines, painful uncuffing, groundless arrests, arbitrary custody, blows leaving no traces, sometimes even torture. The trivialization and normalization of extrajudiciary punishment by the police is a major unrecognized fact in contemporary societies. But why would the police punish? And why would society expect from them that they play this role? Two theories of justification prevail in philosophical and legal literature. For utilitarians, since Jeremy Bentham famously, only, sh only should be taken into account the consequences that punishment may have from the point of view of society. It can only be justified, from a utilitarian perspective, if it contributes to a decline in crime by incapacitating the criminal or rehabilitating him or deterring future crime or combining the three. For retributivists, after Immanuel Kant, only should be taken into account the act that has been committed, punishment being just deserts. It can only be justified for these retributivists if it causes pain on the offender to pay for his offense via a system of equivalence with the suffering he has caused. So for example, if you kill, you, be, you get killed. Focused on reducing crime, the utilitarians look toward the future. Concentrating on the atonement of the offense, the retributivists are mainly oriented toward the past. Is one of these justifications applicable in the case of the police? Let us examine another incident. <coughs> Three adolescents are talking and laughing joyously in a small square uh, near the hostel of the Youth Protection Service where they stay. Like the other minors resi residing, uh, re residing in the uh, three-floor house, they have been placed in this institution by a juvenile judge, either because they have committed a misdemeanor or because they are deemed endangered. The three teenagers are of African origin. Two police officers on patrol stop by and ask for their papers. Such a check is banal but illegal since there is no indication of a crime being or having been committed, and since it is moreover established that such a stop is often based on racial profiling. The adolescents present their travel pass, passes, which are normally regarded <clears throat> as sufficient since it has their name and photograph. But not satisfied, the agents demand their identification card, which they don't have <coughs> uh, with them. They explain where, that they live in the hostel some 50 yards away and propose the officers to accompany them to fetch the, the documents. The police ruthlessly refuse and threaten to take them to the precinct for further uh, verification. Panicked at the prospect of being taken in, one of the teenagers escaped, escapes, runs to his lodging, takes the requested card and swiftly returns to prove his good faith. But the reception is not what he expects. The officers called him harshly using racist slurs while slapping him. 
Alerted by the shouting, one of the social workers of the service gets out only to hear one officer threaten the boy. I'm going to kneecap you and yell at him. You're a failure in your family. You're a failure at school, you little faggot. Not without difficulty, she interposes herself and finally brings the adolescent back to the hotel. There, with the director of the institution, he tries, she tries to convince him to file a complaint against the agent, telling him it is important to defend his rights. Still shaken and distressed by the humiliating and aggressive handling he just endured, the teenager keeps repeating in a low voice that it does not matter. Obviously, he knows how much weight the word of a black minor under the care of a youth protection service would carry compared to the word of two officers. How easily his complaint could be reversed into a case against him for insulting the police and resisting arrest, and in the end, how costly, costly it, would, it could be to try to assert his rights. He impatiently returns to his room. So how to interpret this scene? <clears throat> to the combination of social and racial, racial hostility commonly expressed by the police towards such youth in both words and acts, there is, in this case, a moral aspect. Being under the supervision of the judicial institution, the teenagers have already had dealings with the penal system, either as delinquents or, or as victims, and more often than not, as both. Although the agents pretend to ignore that the boys live in the hostel, they evidently know where they come from, imagine what may have been their story, and mistreat them accordingly. Hence the hassle about the documents, the threat to arrest them, hurtful words, the slaps. It is hardly imaginable that such a scene could have happened in, in a residential area. In fact, in my uh, 18 month, I, I never, 15 months, I never saw that. And that, would, and that for the simple reason that as the head of the anti-crime squad unit told me once, they never went there except in the very rare cases when a crime had been committed there. Their activity was limited to certain territories and population. In the present incident, the level of aggressiveness is all the more remarkable that there, have been no, uh, there has been no wrongdoing, only heckling in a public space. In fact, the officers punish the adolescents not because of what they do, but because of what they are or represent. Lower class black boys of migrant origin, and moreover, with already dealing dealings uh, with the judicial system. This combination of social, racial, and moral attributes is sufficient to presume their culpability, or at least to assume that they deserve a lesson. They deserve a lesson. The psychological harassment and physical abuse do not only allow the police to exert and display their discretionary power, they also serve to inculcate a social order as the youth are, are learning. Excuse me, as the youth are learning through these experiences, their position of social, racial, and moral inferiority. Here, neither the justification proposed by moral philosophers and legal theorists, or the justification provided by the police suffice to account for what is it that's going on there, as Irving Goffman famously has it. In the absence of offense committed, it is difficult to resort to the utilitarian and retributivist arguments in a strict sense to justify the punishment. Even if the officers tell themselves and others that they are strictly enforcing the law by verifying the identity of individuals and teaching them to abide by the rules, it is difficult to justify the verbal and physical violence in the interaction. One must resort to a more general interpretation considering the function that they are assigned by society, which consists in using their discretionary power to call to social order the purportedly, the purportedly dangerous classes. The adolescents, the adolescent understands it, and this is why he knows that it makes no sense to file a complaint. With whom? With the very institution whose members harass him? To be adjudicated by whom? By a justice system in which the word of a young man of color has no weight against the word of sworn in officers? Schooled by an already long experience of interaction with law enforcement, the adolescent knew that he was what uh, John Allen Lee calls police property. Yet, the analysis must go further. 
rationality that proposed by the law, that offered by officers, that elaborated by social scientists, as I'm doing now, does not exhaust the reasons why the police punish as they do. Indeed, as we can see in the case of this adolescent, punishment is always in excess of what it is supposed to be. But why is it the case? Why would officers purpose, purposely put handcuffs incorrectly onto suspects they have arrested so as to painfully twist their arms and make fun of their complaints uh, while taking them into the precinct for questioning, sometimes causing nerve compression that can be irreversible? Why should they take them into custody in filthy and cold rooms without letting them go to the toilets, get something to eat, or even sometimes take their medicines? Why would they intentionally drive their vehicle in a rough way when they extradite uh, prisoners to a faraway jurisdiction so have, so have them bang around and get car sick? Why would they debase them by offensive remarks and threaten them with dismaying prospects? In the act of punishing, something therefore resists rational analysis, or better said, resist being analyzed as rational. Punishment comprises an emotional dimension. One has to take into account what Nietzsche describes as the voluptuous pleasure de faire le mal pour le plaisir de le faire, to, to, uh, to hurt for the pleasure of hurting. Uh, that's in, in French in this text. The enjoyment of violation. Unquote. To punish is to produce a gratuitous suffering, which adds to the sanction for the mere satisfaction of knowing that the culprit or the presumed such suffers. In the assimilation of punishment with pain, and even more in the unnecessary torment that is added to it, one cannot not recognize the expression of cruelty. How else to account for the conditions of the arrest of a 22 22-year-old black man uh, that was last year, a youth worker of Congolese origin. Not only was he beaten up by three officers for having interfered with the violent stop and frisk of friends in his neighborhood, but he also suffered a four-inch deep, four deep wound as the result of the insertion of a police nightstick in his rectum. The, the, the officer said, his baton had slipped involuntarily through the trousers. The, investigation, the investigation, investigating judge thought otherwise and spoke of rape. The surgeons who operated him diagnosed an anal tear and colon perforation. Five, year, five months after this tragic incident, the young man still carried a colostomy bag for his excrement. And when he goes for a walk in his neighborhood, Police officers on patrol make fun of him, asking, remember the baton? And they laugh. If such events are, uh, are rare, they are inscribed in a common pattern of humiliation of young men, most of them of color, through the negation of their masculinity. They are not punished for what they have done, but for what they are. In this sense, abuses cannot be reduced to deviant acts of outliers, sadistic officers. It is not the exception. It is part and parcel of retribution. In fact, society delegates to certain institutions and professions, notably the police, the dirty work, as Everett Hughes uh, writes, of punishing with the implicit permission to exceed the moral and legal limits of punishment. To conclude, my argument implies less a critique of policing than a critique of punishment. One does not understand the reality of punishment and the function of the police if one does not realize that for an important segment of the population, the police are their most ordinary experience of punishment. A punishment that in most cases is not related to what they do or have done, but to what they are or seem to be. 
by eluding this dimension of punishment or by considering that it, it is not punishment because punishment is necessarily a fair legal response by an appropriate institution to retribute an, of, an offender for the offense he has committed, that's the legal definition. One avoids the much needed critique of the dark side of punishment and our collective responsibility in it. And I will leave you with this with a list of names of men who have been killed by the police in recent years in France, an obviously incomplete list in which all the victims except one belong to ethno-racial minorities. Not all citizens are equal, literally under the gun. Thank you. <clears throat>